can I, do, can I start? Go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll confess, one of my absolute favorite things in life to do is to get together with Tad Savinar and we just uh, talk about art, mostly. Um, but it's always a great pleasure to talk about your art. And I think that it was, must have been last spring, it was a, seems like it was around May Day, Easter, whatever, when you called and asked if, you, if I could come to your studio for a visit. And uh, I arrived at your house on a kind of a sunny spring day <laughs> and walked into your studio. And the first thing you said was, uh, it's over, Linda, it's all over. <laughs> That's over. And an over, it became, became quickly apparent that an overarching theme of this exhibition is a sense of doom, a sense of the finality, not only of our lives as human beings, but of the life of our planet. Um, can you maybe start by talking about what it is that made you veer in that direction? I think it's very interesting the way you um, study the world. You're a student of the news and of culture. And what is it that kind of tipped you off that this would be a major theme for your studio practice? Um, uh, I think that that uh, the the period that we have just uh, experienced as a as a culture on the planet, um, the last two or three years has been pretty extraordinary. Um, and you know whether you're a poet or a novelist or a dancer, musician or human being. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, no, a visual artist. Oh. Those people aren't human beings. No, this is, <laughs> now, whether you're any one of those and you are driven to <coughs> wish or feel the need to comment or express your feelings, I find it pretty hard to kind of assume that the last three years or such that we've gone through um, uh, didn't happen. I mean, it's clearly happened. And, and uh, as a reporter on culture, I must report. I'm driven to report. Mm -hmm. um, and at, you know, as you know, and you've even written that, that one of the things I, I take great pleasure in is, is, is looking at a kind of a finite little silly thing mm -hmm. and then exaggerating mm -hmm. it. Because uh, when I see that finite little thing, I think, you know, this is like a canary in the coal mine. So yes. can I build the coal mine? And yes. can I, can I like build the, the mine that surrounds mm -hmm. the canary at the moment the canary falls off the, you know, right. that's, what I, that's what I do. Yes, that is what you do. Yeah. And uh, I, I have to say that I wouldn't have been quite so shocked and maybe sobered when you said, Linda, it's over, it's all over, except that uh, I wouldn't call you a prognosticator. I know you don't assume that mantle of being a, fortune teller or predicting the future, but you, in looking at the scope of your, uh, your work over the course of many decades, you do have a very uncanny and kind of spooky way of seeing something, presenting to your viewer the most unimaginable thing, like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we had to have like tablets announcing that there's H1N1 in the house and we needed these in mass quantities. Um, that's not so funny. That's, a, that's um, very disarming and destabilizing. Um, can you talk maybe about a couple of pieces from your past? Not, I mean, not a whole litany, but a couple of pieces that for you were examples of where you looked at the tiny little thing, the microscopic thing that actually ended up being like real culture well, or, real, or real history? The one, one of the ones you, you mentioned was the, uh, the uh, I developed a window sign for that was just really a, a giant cue, uh, which in my mind was for quarantine and used Spanish and English mm -hmm. on it. Um, and assuming that this was what, when uh, H1N1 was supposed to you know, come after us. Um, so this w it was the period that I designed this. And in my mind, I thought they're going to be in the libraries at a tear sheet, you know, so you, when you go to the library, you're going to pull off a few of these because uh, eventually someone in your household is going to get the H1N1 and you're going to want to tell people that it's there. Um, uh, um, and so that was, that was one of them, but of course it didn't work, it didn't come true for H1N1, but it, you know, right. it, it did talk about quarantine that happened later on. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, the, I, it was interesting. I worked uh, for 10 years in Phoenix on a light rail project, and they, um, they had a name for me there. They coined a name uh, very <laughs> early on, and they called me Chicken Little the Prophet. <laughs> oh. And because like they said, you know, Tad, you always worry about stuff that's going to happen in six months, but we don't r really want to worry about it now. When it happens, we'll fix oh, it. Oh, oh, oh. And so I was the guy that always said, hey, the, the, the sky's falling here. And uh -huh. they said, yeah, we'll deal with that when it, fa when it falls. Oh, and I'm not sure you could do that with climate change. Uh, no, no, you can't. But we but, don't want to talk I, about, we don't no, want to no, make no. this about climate change. No, no, but I, I'm just saying that that, that is, I'm, I'm a worrier. Uh -huh. I'm a warrior, yes. and so uh, I seize on things to worry about, and then I and then I build my case, you know. Right. That I think that's such a, a cogent point because one of the things I love about your work, one of the things that I always uh, g gain so much enjoyment with your work is that it that visually, I look at your work; it's so seductive. So when I received the exhibition announcement for De uh, Desires Denied, I, op I I had it in my hand. I was like, oh, this is such a great graphic. And I almost, it took me a second to remember that it is a piece that's by you and that it has a message because of the strength of the graphicness of mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. I think that you do this thing, um, like Bill Will always says that he uses humor to hook people in. Mm -hmm. Like he has a message, he has something that he wants his viewers to see or think about or um, comment on. And he, his hook is humor. Yours, I think, is the sadic seductiveness of the image. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm telling you, at nighttime reading, I'm just, I didn't get to see that in person before tonight, but I'm in love with that piece. From a purely aesthetic, a, a purely graphic sense of, of what that piece does to me when I'm standing in front of it. Can you talk about that a little bit or, or how, how that has shown up in your work over time? The, I, I'm, I, for my own work, I mean, every artist works differently. My, my, my goal always is to have a beautiful object. And there's no reason why a beautiful object can't carry uh, not so beautiful mm -hmm. content. Um, uh, and so I always, because I think if I can get you, if I can get the viewer even to pay attention for it, for its graphic quality, mm -hmm. hopefully they'll come close enough, at, close enough to it to begin to engage in the mm -hmm. content. And so. I just use beauty as a hook, you know, it's just, I, I mean, I, uh, I'm saying I think some of the things are beautiful and right. I do it on purpose. Right. <laughs> um, it's really, uh, you know, I'm not bragging here, I just, that's what my goal is, is to try and make beautiful objects. Yeah, you do. Um, Wait, um, can you talk a little bit about color? Because I think, first of all, men, could you mention, say a few words about uh, Desires Denied? What, like, what is the subliminal message there? Like, what is it that you see? Once you get past the, the black dots on this sumptuous purple, I, I love that you use purple in this because purple is a color that we associate with royalty, with luxury, with like purple velvet, purple rain. Um, but it's the, the purpleness is the surface or the skin. You need to look beyond, beyond the purple. Yeah, that, this, this um, whole uh, uh, this approach to what I'm calling veiling, which is what that is mm -hmm. and what the what the nighttime reading mm -hmm. is and the small little watch faces in the other room um, is, a, is a kind of a new path and I'm very excited about it. And it, it really has to do with um, a graphically kind of creating a veil mm -hmm. between the viewer and the content. Um, a, a little bit of holding back and with, oh, the, yes. you know, and, and then of course the, the real content is completely obliterated so you can't access it. So it's, right. it's, a, it's kind of come hither stop oh, kind of thing, stop. Um, and I think that that, um, I, th I think uh, for me it's a, it's a, a kind of a new step. I, I think that the, the, you know, you've seen the Rorschachs, the, mm -hmm. the, in, the, in the show there's one, of what I call the Rorschachs, which is a small draw, uh, print over in the beginning of the show with the two horses uh, <laughs> coming, coming towards a, a Rorschach. I, I would, I've spent a lot of time since 2017 trying to find a way to combine uh, an, a, a purely modernist aesthetic with something more natural or more organic. And so I did a hmm. lot of Rorschachs. Um, just plain old, you know, piece of paper, 
spread the ink, turn it over, fold it, call it good, do another one. And, and those, of course, evolved into actually me uh, sometimes, you know, the idea with a Rorschach is everyone knows what the game is. Um, so a viewer is immediately trying to solve the, the puzzle that's been put before them. And so I started manipulating some mm -hmm. of the some of the, the Rorschachs, whereas they weren't, they didn't start as a blob, uh, as a, a, a blob, they actually started as a picture. And then they got obscured when mm -hmm. they did it. Anyway, that, that they have come the closest with this color, with this abstract color field that I'm very interested mm -hmm. in, hmm. in this combination. And these are kind of fall uh, right after that. That, the, the um, how do I, I'm not sure how to exactly. The, in 2013, I tried, did an unsuccessful exhibition with Jamie. I'm sorry, Jamie, wherever you are. Um, <laughs> it wasn't very salesworthy. Uh, where I, I said it's where the old meets the new. Mm -hmm. And that really wasn't the gut of what I was trying to do. It's really this modernist mm -hmm. aesthetic. And I want to use, I want to be able to use the, the power of color mm -hmm. uh, in a very um, intentional way, uh -huh. um, and and um, it, but it, but you don't see it that often in a in a kind of hard edge presentation with uh, recognizable imagery or anything. Organic. Oh, I agree. So it's usually you know. Yeah, a, a I'm not kidding. I think who comes closest to that? Maybe Ed Ruscha a little bit. Maybe a little, yeah. yeah. Have you looked? Moskowitz. At, oh, Moskowitz for sure. Had the dark, had the color fields yeah. with the you know windmill yeah. or it's the been what? Almost forgotten. Yeah, sadly. Uh, important artist. I, I agree. Um, I want you to make, to make sure that you look at desires denied because it's really it's a very sad and poignant piece. If you look at the titles of the magazines that are beyond the veil, and I think by the way I think the idea of veiling is a beautiful way. That's a beautiful moniker for this style mm -hmm. that you're investigating because it's conceptually um, veiling as well. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at kind of the the prompts that all, I mean, does anybody get a magazine anymore? Like you, <laughs> like a Sunset Magazine, the old Sunset Magazine is now just like mine. Like, can you actually get a magazine in the mail? Um, but all of the, like, uh, House Beautiful and uh, Martha Stewart Living and a gardening magazine, all of those things are things that feel a little bit out of touch for today's generations. And if, if not for our generation, it feels kind of out of touch for our generation, but it's really out of touch for our children's generation. Mm -hmm. Like having a House Beautiful worthy home seems fairly unlikely for most of the millennials that I know. And mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the sad? I don't find that nighttime reading is quite so sad. And we should, and we should get off these two the, of my the, favorite the, pieces, but. I, you know, the, uh, socially, culturally, politically, um, things in the American dream didn't turn out quite so well for some people. Right. There's a, a big gap. Yes. Between the haves and the have-nots. And it's and, not shrinking. And even the in-betweeners mm -hmm. dream about how they want to move up the food chain right. or whatever. So this is, this is you know, a, a piece about, uh, you know, what people dream about. Or dreamt about. And or, thought their, or thought their life, their, their yeah. life would turn out different yeah. than it has. Well, there's a lot of nostalgia in it. Like, now, like uh, maybe 20 years ago I was dreaming of the House Beautiful. Now I'm thinking, like, oh, my gosh, if I get sick, will there be... Uh, in the, if I go to the hospital, will there be a nurse that's yeah. not like treating 30 people and will I get the care that I need yeah. or, or whatever? It just seems like our, um, the fantasies of American life are really changing. Um, I want to mention one th more thing about color. Uh, in, you, know, you know how I feel about the color <laughs> puce. Yes, I know. I, th <laughs> I think that death, like the, the use of color in death is so purposeful and so um, particular. You know, Puce is the, um, it basically means flea blood in, uh, and it did in fact used to be a very popular color in, um, in, in France. But tell us about the, um, this really powerful graphic, uh, please keep your distance, wait here, which feels like something you might find in an airport mm -hmm. or in 
social security office or some or a governmental facility and then this very beautiful um steely it's you know you've almost created like a steely or a tombstone on the wall and i have to say i love it love it love it love it that you put it on fabric because you barely need to breathe next to that piece and the ephemeralness mm -hmm. the the way the fabric starts to um waft and and move is it's very elegant but Thanks. you might talk about your use of color in that piece it well i didn't uh the first thing was is i knew i didn't want the letters to be black because that would be just too um standard okay you know? so it was really how can i make this thing seem not of this place mm -hmm. in other words it's there's nothing there's not a scream at a screaming um battle between the the background and the letters and it's just this it's a it's a wisp mm -hmm. I it's guess. a wisp. That, yeah. that was what I was, you know, how can I make something that's a wisp? Yeah, it's like, to me, it's like a, a visual metaphor for just like a thought or, a, or a, a passing thought. But in fact... Well, I mean, it, the piece is real simple. I mean, you know, I've, you're waiting in line and you're, you've got your six feet, you know, between you. Well, the reason you are separated is because you don't want to die. Right. That, that you are creating yes. this distance so you don't get sick and die. Yeah. So let's get to the fucking point. It's about death. <laughs> it's not the backpack that's in front of you on the back of the person. This is what it's about. This is really what it's about. It's not a joke. It's how to stay alive. And then, of course, we're all just waiting. We're all just waiting for uh, and keeping our distance as long as we can through any kind of death. You know, we just want to be alive. Um, so it, 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 it was just kind of... A, I just wanted to say, you know what this is really about? This, you know, this this separation that we're oh, yeah. doing is really I don't mean that I'm I yes, I am a warrior, but I'm not a germaphobe or anything like that. I don't go around worrying about that. But but um but I, I just wanted to kind of really make it clear. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Can we talk about one of my favorite pieces is the Napoleon piece? Yeah. yeah oh my yeah. god, I love that piece so much. It makes me it makes it really makes you me. You talk laugh. about the painting. You describe the painting. I think the date of the painting is about 1900. It's about 1800. This very start of of this entire century that's all about um, power and industrialization and the hubris um, of Napoleon crossing the Alps is just really it's very Trumpian. Mm -hmm. It's very very Trumpian, and I always I like that painting so much because um, it seems like the only being in that painting that really has the appropriate level of of, of fright in its countenance is the horse. <laughs> the horse looks like it's just absolutely like ready to lose it. Yeah. But here goes Napoleon. And I think there's something about that um, hubris or, or arrogance or like unwillingness to look reality in the eye is very much part of American culture in a way that's just really disturbing. And then I'm sure you notice that the Rorschach print, it's like a gigantic penis in the middle of it. Which is like uh, kind of a powerful statement. Can you talk? Can you talk about that? And in particular, I'd love for you to talk about how you source your images like that, because I know how you used to do it. I remember in the old days you used to go. I always love this. In the old days. In the old days. The old days when we were young, you used to go to the library. You used to go to the Multnomah County Library and just look at images. They had an image bank. Yeah. And you could say, I want the file on ovens. Right. And they would, there were people who, who worked at the, li or, you know, uh, friends of the library or whatever, who would just basically cut pictures out I of know. magazines. And then the library would assemble yeah. them by subject Yeah, what matter. a fabulous thing. Do you ever go into the Oregon Historical Society when you could walk in and say, I want to see the, all the photographs right. you have of the yeah. Portland Buccaneers. Yeah. And out comes a, an archival box and you could look at every picture and you mm -hmm. could even own one. You could even mm -hmm. have one Printed, copied. yeah. 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 It's, uh, that feels like a very lost time, but that's how you used to collect images. That's, and, and, and most of the time, I was not looking for something specific. I was looking for something that would mean something to me. And how did you know when something meant something I to you? I have Just no a vis idea. Of a visceral, like, like yeah, oh this shit, is important. look at Napoleon. This is, oh. this is important. This is, you know, this is, and, and, and I, I can't, I can't describe it. It's a, it's a, it's um a kind of a gut response. I mean, the, the, you know, 
talk about this? You know? Yes, yes. The, Let's talk about this. This is a perfect example. Mm -hmm. We, uh, uh, Kate and I were in an antique shop and we were looking around and I, there was a stack of, of clock faces. I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. You know, I didn't buy them, but boy, when I got home, I was I couldn't stop thinking about those mm. clock faces, and so I didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what they were going to be. I didn't, you know, but. I ordered a whole bunch of them, <laughs> many, um, and they eventually worked their way, you know, and, and so this is really common in my work. I, I, used to, yes. I used to describe it like I have a giant hopper in my head, mm -hmm. and uh, occasionally just something will drop down, and I don't know whether it's that, that object dropping down or, or that image or that word is due to something that somebody said or something else I saw or what, I, I, but, it, but it somehow, and, and not to say that, that I work, um, you know, without a guide. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. it, it's just that I find that the way I think, when something presents itself, it usually um, can do some more work for me. Yes, and I, I do want to mention that you, when you say that, it's not just a conceptual thing. It's not like you're thinking like clock faces. No, 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 no. Like you actually, I love the idea that you actually, when you got clock faces, you actually put them on the floor of your studio so that you had to physically cross them. Walk over them. Walk over them in order to access your workspace. The, 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 it's, I like to take things and turn them upside down sometimes because some other, so it's possible that sometimes they present themselves in a different way. And so mm -hmm. putting them on the floor and walking on them totally devalued all the money I'd spent. But it also kind of made this thing I had to deal with. Mm -hmm. And, and it, was, it, it took a while and then it seemed like they need to not to be, I mean, I even thought that in this exhibition they would be at the threshold of the oh, door and that you wow. would come in oh, walking wow. on clocks. You know, I th and, and I thought, and I finally thought, no, that's a dumb idea. They need to be on the wall, huh. you know, and th so, and th then it, pr it just kind of feeds on itself. But, but I, I do like to turn things upside down. And, Were you, know. you worried that, cl that clocks or clock faces would be too literal, a metaphor for the idea of time tick, tick, ticking away? Well, there's no hands. Right. So there's no destination, there's no appointment, there's no beginning, mm -hmm. there's no end. It's a it's continuum. There's no appointed anything, uh -huh. which is totally different than we think about time. Yes, we, it is. Yeah. 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 I, I also think like hardly anybody wears a watch anymore. I know you do. <laughs> I said that to my son, and he was like, "Mom." But but so many so many watches are uh, they're digital, digital and, and yeah, they yeah. they don't have this beautiful clock face. Can you talk to a little bit about how you um, collaged the clock faces and then what, how you went ahead and painted out this, um, this frame that feels very ominous and a little menacing to me? The, uh, it's probably the first time I've ever did a scale study. No way. Yeah. It's really funny. I don't um, believe you. But I had the clocks and I, you know, put them, collaged them down and, okay, I had a small version of right. this, you know, before they went on the panels. Mm -hmm. And so I had that and I looked at it for a long time and I felt that it needed a, a, a framing device to kind of say, no, it's about time, you know, kind of, so, mm -hmm. so that, so that to, to these become just like a, a window frame into the, it's like mm -hmm. this, it's a kind of a little trick. This is on hyper focus, mm -hmm. you know? These are not, so mm -hmm. they're a little bit because they're ob obscured, but even on the edges, they, mm -hmm. they tend to not. So it was a way of saying, kind of like putting arrows or saying, yeah. no, don't you get it? It's about this stuff. Yeah, it's a little bit like a, like a neon sign device without it being neon. And, yeah. and then of course- And, and this was, th this was um, uh, squeegeed on, you know, so, um, but then did you peel, did, like how, how did you get this kind of little bit of scarification or did, did that just come from? It, well, since it was squeegee, the, uh, you know, I put the paint on and mm -hmm. then just squeegeed and then in some places it ran out of paint, uh -huh. you know? And of course I knew the whole dilemma, okay, should I go back and paint those black or, oh you know, I mean, God. all of that, yeah. you know, oh <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, you think about it for, for days, for months, yeah. you know, it's, and, and so, you know, it's, it kind of evolves, you know, yeah. I like to live with it for a while. I really like the antiquatedness. Could we talk about one more piece? That's what I was going to ask. Do, and then also whether um, 
we can have a question and answer. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and what, what, then also if people need to move on, do yeah. feel free. But yes. Ted and I can go on for hours. <laughs> we won't, <laughs> promise. But we, but we, but we can and sometimes do. Yes. One question and then okay, we'll have some. I want to talk like for a nanosecond about the, the beauty of the small sculptures in the, in the front room. Um, we, we had kind of a chuckle and you mentioned a show that was in the past that, that didn't sell well and you were saying like, oh my God, like who's going to buy art that's about doom? Mm -hmm. Well, I would buy a, a the piece with the hand of Fist, God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I find it very, very beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. Can you talk about those? And, and like, I think that's another example of how you use beauty as a hook. Um, and there's a little bit of humor involved. There's a, like a cheekiness, I think, to that piece in particular. Mm -hmm. But could you talk a little bit about the small sculptures? Because I just find them so like jewel-like, um, precious. They all, uh, I, I, I was, you know, like all everybody in this room have been witness to uh, things that are occurring out of our power. Yes. And so the notion of, of home, of, of um, uh, uh, civil systems, um, we, we're kind of in a period where we can't quite assume that, right. that, that those things are going to be working in the same way. And so again, it's, that, it, it, it's kind of an overall concern about you know, you can have a million bucks in the bank and you can have the greatest family in the world and, you know, a tree can fall on your house. You know? yes, it's kind of like you, yes. powers beyond, yes. you know, what we try to control in our yes. daily life. There could, is yes. still f a force much larger, yes. than the, or, or a number of forces, yes. much larger than us. Yes, you could be Harry and Megan and live in Montecito <laughs> and, and there's flooding. No, it's, it's like all you have to do is turn on the news every day and you find there's some version of the right. of God. right. But I have to say that just because the message is a little gloomy and dismal, it does not override the beauty of the object for me. Well, the, the message doesn't have to be gloomy. It's just me saying, hey, you know, we're, we're in a period where we yeah. need to kind of watch, uh, watch out for things that we didn't have to watch out for. Before. Yeah. Well, should we answer some questions? Yeah, you should answer questions. questions. No one has any questions. You must questions. have comments. They're like, tired of us. They don't want <laughs> Do, do you find them show up? David? Well, hey, David. Hi. Um, it's about the two tabs. Uh, the, uh -oh. um, the kind of perspective you have with your art, and then many of us know you as an urban planner, mm. which is a very optimistic. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just, just curious, how are you coexisting with yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that would be a good essay. Are <laughs> 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 just two separate people? That no, no, no. I'm, no, and and it, I mean, I'm not. I I I, I don't. These are not works uh, that that uh, stand on negativity. Uh, it's just merely reporting. I've said for years, I'm nothing but a reporter. Um, just saying, this is going on, or this is what this looks like to me, or this is how I feel. Do you feel that? Do you see that? Are you experiencing that? It's a way of communicating with a viewer and saying, hey, I, uh, maybe uh, you know, no one has told you this before, or maybe um, you and I are experiencing the same thing, but we haven't talked about it yet. So it's a, it's, it's a, the work is really intended to start that conversation with the viewer. Um, it's not a, oh my god, we're going off a cliff. So well, you maybe we are kind of going off a cliff, but no, no, I mean. <laughs> so you didn't find yourself pulled in by this? Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not uh, sitting around, you know, doom and glooming. I'm, I'm making art. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I, it, it, it's, um, yeah, it's interesting that the, the subject matter is certainly something um, that may not be 100% positive, but, uh, it certainly needs to be spoken, uh, you know, as any writer or poet, dancer feels the need to speak. Um, and I think it's through that speaking that we understand that we're not isolated individuals which have, which have nothing to do with the other person, that we actually do have some of these common things, but uh, it's a way of bringing some of that to the surface. So, Jordan. I knew you were going to have a question. What do you got? <laughs> so you have 
clock, there's no hand. Look at this. Ticking, not ticking. You have a piece on death. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know where you go. Yeah, <laughs> magazines that uh, I do get 30 of them a month, but for uh, most it is a dying uh, method of communication. Are you sensing a greater sense of mortality? Well, sir, oh, I mean, wow. certainly I. As a chronicler of our times, I always say, are yeah. you yeah, 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 yeah. No, ab absolutely, I can't, I can't deny it, of course, but, but in my, somebody asked me the other day, it was you, <laughs> it was you who asked me this, gee, wouldn't it be great to go back and be 20 again? Oh my and do you remember what I said to you? 30 would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember what I said to you is, no, I wouldn't go back but I'd like to live forever in the life that I have now. Oh, And so that oh, is, that that's is, so lovely. Um, that's how I feel. And, 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 and I don't think, um, you know, expressing concern or, or, or my experiences over challenges in, in our life is, is uh, necessarily about my own mortality. I, I, I feel, um, I feel so fortunate and blessed. So. Um, I don't have a demeanor uh, of doom and gloom. So that makes the work even more poignant because here's a guy who's happy and lucky, everything is good, he's healthy, he's you know, having a great life, and he sees some bad stuff happen. Mm -hmm. so, um. I wanted to ask about the supernatural sort of feeling that I get from your three small pieces. Oh, oh yeah. The house with the yeah. Mm -hmm. going on, the hand of God. It's very supernatural to me, mm -hmm. these, these unusual powers that mm -hmm. are going on. It, 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 I, I don't think supernatural, but I think larger than us. Okay. I mean, that was kind of the idea, was that, uh, um, the, that we, work, I, we work to have a contented, happy life uh, that, that's well-meaning. Um, but there are other things that are that don't have to behave in the way that we would like them to behave. And so it's, it's kind of that um, uh, sense, of, sense of, of other things going on. Not, not by a specific, but, but, but that, yeah, yeah. Um, I like that you say supernatural, though, because yeah. I think there's definitely, uh, you can't deny that there's a spookiness. <laughs> that there's a, 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 a yeah. kind of a simmering <laughs> spookiness <laughs> in this. <laughs> Okay. Tad, death, <laughs> on puce. <laughs> That's pretty spooky. Brian? Tad, does any of your experiences in Florence play into these? Oh, what a beautiful question. Um, because that's kind of a different life. You yeah, know. no, it's a different life. Um, uh, I have, I, I, on two occasions, I rented studios when I was in Florence. Um, to work on things, um, does it really influence? I mean, I think you know the sense of craft, and and and, and you know what I'd have to say, uh, the timelessness. I mean, the mm. fact that you know Florence is where the Renaissance <laughs> started, and and it's so um, rich in that history. Just walking. I mean, you don't have to go to a museum. It's just extraordinary, and and the culture, um, and and it's a very very specific um, atmosphere. Um, uh, I don't know how that comes into the work. Uh, I've always been a craft fanatic. I've always wanted stuff to be really tight and crisp, you know, how they were produced and kind of obsessive about that. Um, but I, I uh, yeah, I think, I think Florence helped me have a, a greater sense of humor, too. Mm. Chat? Yeah, I'm wondering about the, uh, again, the relationship between urban planning and art, which is intriguing to me, and how you might um, connect the two, thinking of Florence, thinking of urban design and urban planning in yourself, and how you, you think of art and your planning, and they sort of work together to create who you are, who I've known you as. 
It's, it's interesting, once I was uh, working with Greg Baldwin, who is a uh, very talented urban designer here in Portland, and uh, he said to me, Tad, stop acting like an urban planner. Start <laughs> acting like an artist. Because I, like, I was like trying to be junior planner. Mm. You know, and he said, that's not why you're here. We want you for the creative stuff. You know, it's very funny. Uh, I, I don't know how I, I mean, I have actually a few careers um, over time. So I seem to be able to move somewhat seamlessly from these things. I don't know what the, you know, theater and then we have a family real estate business, you know, small. Um, so I don't know how that, I think it's all the same tad. Um, it's just a different, uh, different arena. Um, I don't, I don't know. Ron. It's more of a comment, Ted, than a question. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting us mm -hmm. to be here tonight because it, it emphasizes the importance of personal connection between the artist and the work and, and the value that we have in sharing community. Because I read the entire book and talk about starting conversations. I was, I was sad in reading it because I got a much darker, deeper, mm -hmm. negative, gloom and doom. Mm -hmm. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing we can do about it in, in interpreting that and I'm so appreciative. But hearing <laughs> you talk about it because I know you, I thought, oh my God, this is not, this is not going there. <laughs> it was pretty doomy and gloomy and it's several studio, yeah, studio yeah, visits. Yeah, yeah, it was, yeah. Steve, you have some? I did have a, I did have a question. I mean, obviously your work is always about ideas, and based on ideas. And then you make choices about the materials and making those ideas manifest. And I know in my own personal experience, a lot of times the, the work is defined by the exploration of material. Right. And I wonder for you, hmm. what your relationship to material is. <coughs> this is a, a um, I mean, I, I basically used to make everything, all my art had to be made with my own hands. Yeah. Um, and there were lots of things that my hands were not able to do because I wasn't, I didn't have the skill set. So I could really only do uh, what I had the skills to do. After I got involved in the theater, I saw how many people work on bringing a play to the stage. Um, and scores of people, and all have their fingerprints, and it makes that thing happen. Um, and so after being involved in the theater, I thought, maybe this is the way to work, is to actually uh, engage people who have the skills to do what I envision and that I'm not held back by my own skills anymore. And that opened up a huge flood since the 90s that I've, that I've um, pursued. And it gives me the freedom to, when I come up with an idea for something, I ask myself, is this a bumper sticker? Is it a t-shirt? Is it a print? Is it a sculpture? Mm -hmm. Is it a book? Is it a song? I mean, I have no, um, I'm not tethered to a media. Um, and, and so that has given me an amazing amount of freedom. My shows tend to look like group shows or something, you know, mm. because, because there's so many different media. But, but um, it's really just that freedom that is extraordinary for me to, to not be tethered um, to, you know, uh, doing one media. So, so that's my, it's my love of the materials is really, and, and the, the people I have met um, and who have helped me in this pursuit is just extraordinary skills. Um, so, so thankful for that. So. Well, Call it a night. I, I, aren't I lucky to be working <laughs> with you? And, you know, with, you know, really, such and humor, because I love that, and beauty. I mean, it really, thank you for Thank you for having here. us. And Linda, you're always so wonderful, oh, Jamie. so insightful. <laughs> and I love your comment about that being on the spine yes. instead of on concrete or marble. <coughs> all, all the more like how delicate a line like yes. between life and death. Anyhow, so 
I should end that life. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming, and uh, please hang around if you want. And do you mind if I say something about Moose Pack? No, of course not. So we all wear a lot of hats in our life. And um, for community, I'm a board member of Blue Sky, and the cap is showing up, and uh, Chris and Dan are here, and our new gallery director. Oh, yay! Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. Oh, yay. very, very capable, and I think he's going to do wonderful things for Blue Sky, and I hope everybody joins. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.